So let's study women's sums and definite integrals a little further. So what I want to show you first is a really cool app that you can find on the Mad World uh, Wolfram website, which uh, gives you a very good way of uh, seeing what a Riemann sum is and how it approximates the area under a graph. So if you go to this address here, this URL, you'll have uh, access to this uh, app, which is pretty cool. So here I chose a function, just arbitrary function, x squared plus 2, and I chose x to go from 0.5 to 4. And I ask the app to uh, draw the Riemann sum for eight rectangles, and that's exactly what it did. So you see these eight rectangles here just provide the Riemann sum, and it provides a pr pretty good approximation of the area under the graph. Now, as you can see, you expect the area, the estimated area, to be a little uh, higher than the actual area because the rectangles are all a little higher than the function. And indeed, what it calculated is that the estimated area is about 32, while the actual area is about 28 for this particular choice of function. Now, if you increase the number of rectangles, suppose I choose... Uh, 50 rectangles. Now you expect the estimated area to get closer to the real area. And indeed, now there's many more rectangles, and the esti estimated area is now 28.8, which is much closer to 28.3. And if I were to choose something like 300 rectangles, it would get even closer. It takes a little while to calculate, but you'll see what happens. So now the estimated area, I guess, will be 28.4. Let's see. 28.38, I'm pretty good. So yeah, so you see that it's getting pretty close to the actual area here. Okay, let's go back to 8. Now, there's different choices you could have done for your Riemann sum. So we chose to be our, chose our rectangles to be such that the right side of the rectangle intersects the graph. But in fact, we could have chosen the rectangles so that the left side intersects the graph. That will be called the left point rule. So here I can choose that, so I chose left. That see what happens. So now you see I still have a good approximation of the area, but now I expect my approximations to be smaller than the actual area. And that's exactly what happened. I get about 25 instead of 28.2. And if I increase the number of rectangles here, I'll get a much better approximation again. Now in the limit where n goes to infinity, I'll get the exact, the precise actual area, and it doesn't matter whether I choose the left point rule or the right point rule, because in that limit they'll both give me the exact same number. But if I'm only interested in a finite number of rectangles, then in fact I might be interested in getting a better approximation. Instead of having the left point rule or the right point rule, what I could do is choose my rectangles so that they intersect the graph right in the midpoint of each rectangle. So here I can do that. Choose midpoint. And now you see that you expect this to be a much better approximation. Indeed, now I get 28.24 instead of 28.29, so that's a really good approximation. So this is called the midpoint rule, and if you are only interested in approximating the area by choosing a finite number of rectangles, this is probably your best choice. But if you're interested in the n goes going to infinity limit, namely the definite integral, then it doesn't matter which of these rules you choose because they all give the same answer. Okay, so let's go back to definite integrals. So what we've seen in previous video is that uh, we can define, in fact, that the, the n equals infinity limit of the Riemann sum gives you a precise calculation of the area under the graph. And we define that as being the definite integral of our function from x equals to a to x equals to b. That's what this symbol here means. Now here I'm allowing the, this is the, the point of the rectangles that intersects the graph. I allow it to be anything because it doesn't matter in the limit, they all give the same thing. But in practice, we usually choose the right point rule where our rectangles intersect the graph on the right side of the rectangle. Okay, just a few names here. So this symbol here is called an integral sign. A here is the lower limit of integration. B is the upper limit of integration. And f of x, the function we're integrating, we usually call it the integrand. Right. Now, this limit here may not actually exist. It does happen. We'll see cases where it does not exist. But if it does, then it's great. This all makes sense. And we say that the function f is integrable, meaning that we can integrate it on the interval a to b. And the process of computing this number here, the definite integral, is called, not surprisingly, integration. Okay, that's great. So we'll see in class a bunch of examples where we use the definition of integrals, so we'll define, we'll use this definition of the definite integral as being the limit of a Riemann sum to calculate the integrals. But you'll see very quickly that this is a very tedious process, it's quite annoying, and it's actually only uh, accessible, you can really only do it for very simple functions, otherwise it just gets out of hands. 
So uh, what we want to do in this class is find better ways of integrating, better ways of calculating this number without having to evaluate the Riemann sum and take its n equals to infinity, n goes to infinity limit. All right. So let's go back now to the uh, interpretation of the Riemann sum in terms of geometry. Okay, so suppose I have my function here, so I'm choosing a function f of x, whatever the function is, and I assume that it's positive, right, just as I did before. So I have two points, say a, and here I choose another point b, and my function is positive over this interval. So by definition, I know that what the definite integral of the function between a and b is doing is just calculating the area under the graph. Right? This is how we define it as being the limit of the Riemann sum. So I can say that in words, if the function is positive over my interval a and b, then the integral of my function here represents the area between the y equals to zero line, the y equals to f of x that curve here, and the x equals to a and x equal to b lines. Great, so that was uh, exactly how we define definite intervals. However, f of x may not be positive, right? Suppose I choose this function and I choose my a and b to be two points, say, here, something like that. Now the question is, what is this integral here, the definite integral of my function, now calculating? Is it calculating the area above the graph? It's not so obvious, in fact. And if you look back at the definition of the definite integral, this was the limit as n goes to infinity, as some summation, i equals 1 to n of f of x i delta of x. And now you see what happens. f of x i here, this part here, is negative over the interval. So this will give me a calculation of the area above the graph, but with an overall negative sign. So this area here is not quite given by the definite integral anymore. It's given by minus the definite integral. So we get that following statement. So if the function is negative over an interval, then minus of its definite integral represents the area between y equals to 0, y equals f of x, x equals a, and x equals b. All right, that's good. But now what about if I choose a complicated function which is neither positive nor negative? So suppose I have this function, and my a is here, my b is here. So I ask you, what is the integral of the function from a to b calculating? Well, now you can combine the two previous statements. So let me just introduce some notation. So let me call this region here r1. This region here I'm going to call r2. And this region here... I will call R3, intersection point I'll call C1, intersection point here I'll call C2. Now with this notation, I can calculate what the integral is, is giving me here. So if I integrate my function from A to B, I know that over the first part of the interval from A to C1, I'll be calculating the area of R1 because the function is positive. Now here the function is negative, so between C1 and C2 I'll be calculating minus the area of R2, and here I'll be calculating the area of R3. So the first statement here is exactly what I just said. The definite integral gives me the area of R1 minus the area of blah, the area of R2 plus the area of R3. So this we call sometimes the net area, or what I prefer, the signed area, which reminds us that we have to have a negative sign whenever the function is negative. Now, if, on the other hand, you're not interested in the definite integral, but you're interested in actually calculating the area that I've uh, shaded here, so r1 plus r2 plus r3, well, you can also express that in terms of definite integrals. So what you would get is that the area of the shaded region is the same as the definite integral of a from a to c1 minus the definite integral from c1 to c2 plus the definite integral from c2 to b. In other words, these two statements follow from the two previous statements, and it just depends what you're interested in. Either you're interested in calculating the definite integral, or you're interested in calculating the area here. Okay, great. So that's, that's nice, because that gives you a pretty geometric understanding of what integrals mean. And in fact, in practice, if we are able to calculate these areas using other means, like for example, if in this case the curve is quite complicated, but if the curve 
was pretty easy. Maybe we could calculate this area using areas of triangles or circles or things like that. That may give us some very efficient way of calculating integrals. That would be a lot faster than evaluating Riemann sums. And in fact, we'll see in class as well that using this geometric point of view, we can deduce or prove a lot of properties of definite integrals that are actually pretty cool. So we'll see all of that in class this week.